Hello and welcome to the Use Because podcast. Deeper learning from the best business minds to have ever put pen to paper. Hello and welcome to this week's podcast. This one is all about this book here. It's called uh, Working Backwards and it's by um, Colin Breyer and Bill Carr. Anyone who is uh, an Alan Partridge fan uh, may or may not understand why the name Bill Carr is funny. You'd want to be a uh, serious Alan Partridge fan to have, think that was funny. I, I, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's a funny joke out of Alan Partridge. So anyway, this book is all about, uh, well, it says it on it there, inside stories and secrets from inside Amazon. Uh, Colin and Bill both worked for uh, Amazon for many years, and they both worked quite closely with Jeff Bezos. So their insights are ridiculously good. Um, it's a say this all the time but it is a great book it's a great read Um, Colin was Jeff's shadow he's his technical advisor and and anyone who who has been in that role over the years has been known as as as, uh, Jeff's shadow and uh, Bill was the senior vice president of digital business which involved you know Prime, Kindle, um, AWS I think at one stage as well so the book is all about how uh, how they built the business or how not even how they built it how they it is how they built it, but it's it's really about how they um, how they think through problems and how they think through the the next thing that needs to happen. Right? How do we how do we I hate this expression, but how do we ten x you know what we're already doing and selling whatever particular product? So the book is really um, it's all the insights about how they how they go about whether it's a new product, uh, improving a process that already exists. Um, how to run um, meetings, all, all kinds of things like that are all kind of in it. But one of the things they start with, and I've written them out here, uh, is there are 14 principles that are leadership principles and, and what they call mechanisms. Uh, I won't read through them all because they're, they're, they're quite involved, but you can actually Google them. If you Google Amazon leadership principles, they, there's a page on Amazon, which I wasn't aware of. Um, that they're all there and they have been updated. I think in this book they had 14. I think in reality there might be 16 now, if I remember right. Um, one of them, and this is, this is everyone knows this one, the first one is customer obsession, that they, they obsess over their customers. Like, why is this good for the customer? Uh, why will the customer care? Um, uh, and, and then so with each of these principles as well, they're, they're giving out a the principle and then like a little paragraph. So I'll give you the, the, a few of them because they're kind of interesting. Leaders start with the customer and work backwards. Uh, they work vigorously to earn and keep customer trust. Although leaders pay attention to competitors, they obsess over customers. And that, that the, the, I love that bit, that they pay attention to competitors, but they obsess over customers. Of course, it's important to know what your competitors are doing. But if you, if you, just, if you just react to everything a competitor does, then, you know, what are you at really? Like, they're, you're you're all the time in reaction mode rather than proactive mode. So by obsessing over customers, they're able to make sure that they're the ones who are um, uh, leading the charge, I suppose. Uh, Another one, ownership. Uh, Leaders are owners. They think long-term and don't sacrifice long-term value for short-term results. They act on behalf of the entire company beyond just their own team. They never say, that's not my job. One of the things they say at the very beginning of this book is that when you're in a meeting like one of those I suppose at any level but the, the higher level meetings if you suggest something that'll make a quick book uh, you'll be frowned at that's not how they play the game they play the game they play the long term game and they talk a lot in the book as well about how they have uh, had a lot of failures along the way and um, I think the the fire phone it was one of them that it was an absolute um, disaster of a thing nobody wanted it nobody cared um, but they they don't not that they don't care about failures, but they kind of see themselves failing towards success, which is a great way to, to think about it. So that long-term value is what they're looking for, not short, short-term short results. So they're not looking to make a quick buck off a customer and um, lose the customer, which is, you know, no no company really is going to do that. Um, no long-term thinking company is going to do that. But a lot of companies do do it, where they discount something or they, you know, it's, it's a cheap and nasty way to, to make some money. Whereas they're in for like years and decades, really, um, in Amazon. So uh, the long-term value over the short-term results is something that's talked about a lot throughout the book. Um, How they'll stick with a project for years and years. There's a great quote. Um, 
from I'm going to paraphrase it from from Jeff Bezos in the book where he was being interviewed by after this um, phone came out the 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 fire phone I think I've got that name right the fire phone came out um and somebody said so that was some some journalist asked him so that's a pretty big failure he goes if you think that's a big failure what you see the big failures you've got coming next like he didn't care about the failure didn't care that you know something didn't work he goes it's it's all about the process that we improve the process to make sure that the next thing that we attempt we learn from what happened with the phone and we try and correct those mistakes and you see it all the time like uh, from that then i think came the kindle and um prime you know they, they kind of use that process to, to iterate towards uh, more successful things so they don't, really don't care which leads to the next uh, principle which is invent and simplify leaders expect and require innovation and invention from their teams and always find ways to simplify they are externally aware uh, look for new ideas from everywhere and are not limited by not invented here as we do new things we accept that we may be misunderstood for long periods of time and that takes balls from from the leadership top top leadership all the way down to to allow that to happen um to be wrong or to be misunderstood for a long time in order to to see out their vision um another one then this is another thing they talk about in the book in the the bar raiser process hire and develop the best leaders raise the performance bar with every new hire and promotion they recognize exceptional talent and willingly move them throughout the organization leaders develop leaders and take seriously their role in coaching others we work on behalf of our people to invent mechanisms for development like career choice um other things then they think big they buy us for action speed matters in business this is genius i love this one many decisions and actions are reversible and do not need extensive study we value calculated risk taking and that's that's a great thing in business like the amount of businesses you know should we enter the german market or should we not um you know most decisions are reversible maybe that one going into a new new whole new country might not be that reversible but in general most decisions are reversible so you, it's speed matters more than um more than trying to get the exact perfect right decision I've, I've read that before other places as well that that no decision is worse than the wrong decision at least if you make the wrong decision you can go down a particular path and say right well uh, we know this is not working let's reverse out of it and, and try a different one but if you just the whole time spinning your wheels wait to see which path should we take that can be a disaster and um, other things then frugality you know uh, accomplish more or less nothing really new there and uh, another one that they talk a lot about in the book is to dive deep and the explanation for that is that leaders operate at all levels, stay connected to the details, audit frequently, and are skeptical when metrics and anecdotes differ. No task is beneath them. That, again, ties into something I've talked a lot about in the Captain class and Legacy. And there's another book on leadership as well, where the, the real true leaders are not the ones who shout and roar and are the stars of the team. They're the ones who carry the water. They're the ones who... Um, you know do the thankless jobs and that's exactly what they're talking about there is that no task is beneath them uh, ha- another one then have backbone disagree and commit leaders are obligated to respectfully challenge decisions when they disagree even when doing so is uncomfortable or exhausting <laughs> i can imagine trying to disagree with jeff bezos could be exhausting trying to get your point across but steve jobs said that as well actually um there was one time where somebody was you know in a stand-up row with with steve jobs and the guy backed down and then in the end it turned out that he shouldn't have backed down because he was right and steve jobs was really really annoyed because the guy why did you give up your point then just because it was became difficult so uh you know having backbone is is you need to have conviction i suppose another good book for that is radical candor by kim scott she talks a lot about um, how to have those full and frank conversations with people um, respectfully and um, without 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 too much emotion I was going to say but that's not what I mean I mean by with using emotion as part of your toolkit really which is what she talks about in that book um, did a podcast on it as well um, yeah so leaders have conviction and are tenacious uh, they do not compromise for the sake of social cohesion uh, once a decision is determined, de- determined they commit wholly so basically that's a way for them to avoid group think there is um uh they do not compromise for the sake of social cohesion like it's no no problem if you want to just keep arguing and keep arguing the second last one i thought was pretty funny strive to be the earth's best employer i think they have a bit to go there from the stories you hear about how amazon people are treated in their their fulfillment centers 
I'll read out what it says anyway. Uh, so strive to be Earth's best employer. Uh, lead us work every day to create a safer, more productive, high-performing, more diverse, and more just work environment. They lead with empathy, have fun at work, and make it easy for others to have fun. Leaders ask themselves, are my fellow employees growing? Are they empowered? Are they ready for what's next? Leaders have a vision for and commitment to their employees' personal success, whether that be at Amazon or elsewhere. No, is that true? I don't know. <laughs> don't work there. So uh, the book starts there. So that, that's something that they mentioned at the very beginning of the book, these principles that kind of guide everything that, that happens in Amazon. And what's interesting about those principles is that in a lot of companies, they'll have these values and um, slogans, if you like. We strive for this and we always, you know, blah, blah. I mean, they don't actually really do any of that shit. They, do, they, they say all those things and the, the leaders do whatever they're going to do. That's the kind of thing. Those kind of principles are something that has to come from the top down. It has depending on what level you could be a, a mid-level manager you're the top for your team um as much as possible but really if you if you really want success with this kind of thing that these kinds of um, principles has to come from the very very top down i think i've probably used this analogy before in other episodes where if you've ever been to a wedding and the 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 uh, bride and groom are you know tense and, and not enjoying themselves and that filters down through the rest of the the people that are there, I think. But if they're laid back and having a good time, generally that relaxes everybody else and it's they kind of set the tone, I think, for the day. Same in a school. I've seen it before with um I so quick story. I uh, I studied to be a teacher many years ago, maths and, and physics and stuff like that. All the numbers stuff. And uh, I was in a school in Wales, right, in the UK. Uh, that's where I studied. And uh, and on the first day of school, all all the whole school was brought into. Actually, sorry, not all all the school. It was all the the what we call first year kids, like the uh, year sevens, I think, in America. Um, I don't know what they're called in the UK now. That actually was there, but the thirteen year olds, right, twelve and thirteen year olds, and they start high school or secondary school. And it was a huge school, and there was probably a thousand of these kids, eight hundred or thousand of these kids. Like there was, it was a ridiculous amount of kids, and. Uh, they were all brought in, they're all kind of giddy and excited and babyish, you know. But then the the principal swept into the room, which was wearing one of those cloaks, you know, like the Harry Potter, um, what's it, Snape, what's his name? Professor Snape, that kind of gown thing. And she flows into the into the room from the back of the room and, and had two teachers walking behind her, like almost like two assistants. And she swept, swept up to the podium and, you know, a hush descends over the over all the kids and i had never met this woman this was my first day into school as well i was 24 maybe or 25 at the time and i was a student teacher and i'm lined up along the sides with all the other teachers you know doing crowd control kind of stuff and she gives this big long speech about you know uh, respect for each other and respect for your school and all the usual stuff and then she just sweeps out of the room again, like with this billowing kind of uh, gown behind her, the two teachers walking behind her as well. I, mean, I remember being terrified, going, Jesus Christ, like, she's really like, she's really serious. And But what she's all just doing is setting the tone because what was happening straight after that first assembly was that she wanted to meet all of the new teachers, all of the new student teachers, and probably eight of us, I think, at the time. And we all went and waited outside her office and, you know, we were, you know, uh, told to enter the office and I was gone Jesus am I gonna have to deal with this you know uh, really intense woman and she could not have been nice oh, hello hello and she's like oh you're from Ireland fantastic great to meet you and she had scones and clotted cream and, and jam and cups of tea for everyone it was a couldn't have been nicer but that was just her setting the tone from the very top filtered down through her year heads and filtered down through all the students in the school and everyone involved this is the t- this is the 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 level that we're setting and uh you know it, it, it worked like for a school that big she had to she had to do that kind of thing but the exact same thing as Am- in amazon jeff bezos when he was there i think he's not the, the ceo anymore but he he had to set the tone for what was expected we expect people to invent things here we expect people to take responsibility for what they're doing get things done obsess over customers um you know they want to be the best employer on earth right that, all those kinds of things uh are, are really important so anyway, the principles, they all come from the um, from the top down. Think about that. So 
mechanisms then is what they talk about then in the first chapter, how they actually go about, you know, planning out their process. And I found this quite interesting. I'm, I'm, one of the things I'm really into is um, efficiency and, and how do companies set out their plan for the year? How do they decide what to do next? Especially like with Amazon. And when this book was written, I think in, in 2018, uh, they were closing in on about a million uh, employees. Like how do you, how do you plan for that? And the way it plan, the way it starts is that they have uh, the S team, or the S team is the the senior team, um, and they start with some high level, high level, high level objectives. So the objectives could be for one particular um, strand of the business to go from ten billion dollars to fifteen billion dollars. <laughs> I like that idea of of uh, let's get an extra five billion dollars um, through this particular uh, branch of the business. You figure out how to do it, right? I don't know. It's not up to me. Uh, I want an extra five billion from this next year. I'm sure it doesn't. I'm sure they don't just you know pull it out of their arse, but they they must to some point just to at some point they'll go. Well, why not sixteen? Why 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 fifteen billion? Like I don't know. I'm curious about all kinds of things. But anyway, they set their high level objectives, and then what happens is that each team starts on the granular plan from the bottom up on how they will actually accomplish those things. And this is called uh, OP1. I think it's Operational Plan 1. And what they do is they assess their past performance, they look at their key initiatives, their income statements, the P&L for that particular business, uh, the resources that they're going to need. And then what happens is they have uh, the senior team then meet with, with these with each, each individual team and they kind of have to uh, close the distance on, well, we want this much and we think you're going to be able to do this and kind of you know have to meet in the middle. Uh, so they reconcile basically from these these bottom up plans and the top down plans. How do we make sure that we're actually um, doing these things correctly and, and we're going to achieve what we're, we're hoping to achieve? And then in January they have uh, OP two, which is the operational plan two, and what that does is it it, it tweaks that yearly plan um, and it takes in Q four from the last year and uh, whatever performance happened there. And they adjust their plan accordingly. So usually the OP1 is, you know, months of work. And OP2 then is, is a few weeks work to kind of make sure that um, everything is lined up and, and tickety-boo. Um, and then what's interesting about those goals that they set is that they only ever expect three quarters of those goals to be reached because they're so aggressive. Um, I, th- I think that's weird because are you kind of giving people an excuse then not to achieve their goals or... I don't know, but they, uh, what do I know? I don't, I don't run Amazon. Um, so yeah, so it says S team goals are so aggressive that they only expect three quarters to be met, which three quarters though. And, and what, what about the other quarter? Are they, did they just excuse it or what? I don't know. It doesn't really say in the book, but I, I think the point there is that they, they, they have such ludicrous goals that if they get three quarters of them, then they're, they're in good shape. Next thing they talk about then is hiring, and this is something I've seen before. When when they kind of tease this out in the second chapter and uh, the bar raiser process, uh, they tease it out to the point that I thought, I wonder, is this something totally revolutionary or something I haven't seen before? But it's not. It, it and it could be that that the bar raiser process was something that Amazon invented or Amazon kind of came up with first, and then other other places just adopted it. But the idea is that the the, the new hires should raise the bar of the team that they're joining so that they should be able to do something that the rest of the team that they're joining cannot do. And there's eight steps in the uh, in the process for, for hiring. And if you've ever applied for jobs in the last probably five years with the more 10 years, probably in, with any of those big you know, super duper American tech companies, you'll this is this is familiar, I think. Um, so the eight steps are the job description, CV review, phone screen, in-house interview, written feedback, reference check, and offer through onboarding. And so what they're talking about there is that the, the um, well, one, actually one of the things that, that is really interesting is the written feedback, because they, they tell a story that the, um, somebody got hired in a fairly senior position, and when it, it didn't work out, the person wasn't who they thought it were going to be, and they weren't able to kind of adjust to being Amazonian, as they call it. And they look back through their process, and they realized a couple of fundamental errors. And one of them was the written feedback. So somebody who had interviewed um, as part of the, the interview process and interviewed this candidate, 
uh, hadn't written down their feedback, but when it came time to offer their feedback, they just kind of went along with what everyone else said. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, I, th- I had a good feeling about him and thought he was going to be great and blah, blah, blah. So what they have to do is that they have to, um, when they go through the, the, the interview process, everyone has to take time to, to write their feedback down before there's any consultation with anyone else on the interview panel so that everyone does it in isolation and um, it's completely independent which is great and it takes a lot of discipline I suppose to do that because everyone is busy all the time how do you find 20 or 30 minutes to write down what you think of this person and then you don't there's an ego thing there as well I would imagine where you know if there's five people on the interview panel and four people hate them the person they interviewed and one person thought they were great then oh shit well, I <laughs> You don't want to, there's a bit of an ego thing there as well. I don't want to be the one, the odd one out. But again, that comes back to one of their principles to it's okay to be wrong. And you don't want to do it just for social cohesion. Um, yeah, so I, well, the note I took here is that everyone has to write their feedback impressions of the candidate before they confer with the rest of the team. This stops any sort of bias, which is a great way of doing it. Um, now, I've been through that process with some of those big fancy companies Um like from from the candidate's point of view it's a bit annoying uh you know doing a phone interview and then an, an in-house interview which is obviously all online these days and then they go and they do their their written feedback and they check references and all that and then offered through onboarding so they offered through onboarding means that they just um you're not on you're not they don't officially consider you there until until you show up on day one basically um so next thing to talk about then is uh, was organizing. I should have said actually right at the very beginning of this that the, the book is called Working Backwards. And this this comes from um, the first principle of customer obsession. I've just looked at that. I've, I've written down Working Backwards on, on the top of the thing there, but I haven't actually explained. They always think about it from the point of view of what does the customer actually want and how do we work backwards from that rather than saying, right, well, how do we, um, how do we make the best product possible? It's like... Uh, it's like when South Africa tried to get rid of apartheid and they'd know and they put a panel together of, of people and there was no black people on the panel. You think, what is that? You know, that it, it was all white people deciding how to get rid of apartheid. And it's kind of like the it's kind of like the same thing, I suppose, here that there would be no point in, in all these people getting into a room saying, What do our customers want? Well, I think they want this and I think they want that. And then building a product that they then push out and hope that the customers want. Go and to work backwards, go and talk to the customer first or see it from a customer's point of view and work backwards and there's, there's a thing that they do which i'll get to in a few minutes um that helps them with each new product that they that they launch um so anyway organizing then uh they tell a story about um being in a meeting with jeff bezos and there was one particular uh project that was stuck in red so they'd red orange and green i suppose for for where a project is and this particular project had been stuck in red for the last two quarters. And, you know, Jeff was like a, a, a dog with a bone, wouldn't let it go, going, why is this not, you know, moving out of red? Why aren't we moving forward on this? And it was all the usual things that would happen that you'd imagine in a meeting like that with a CEO or there's uncomfortable silences, people trying to cover for each other. And uh, it basically came down to that it was no one person's job. There wasn't one particular person who was responsible for taking this project and pushing it on there was like a committee of people who were doing all these other jobs but you know maybe 25 percent of their time or 50 percent of the time was given over to this project that was stuck in red and that's where they came up with what they called a single threaded leadership solution and single threaded leadership was that if let's say it was the kindle um somebody gets moved onto that project you are the person who delivers me the kindle um, as a product you and, and it's your job then to pull in the teams that you need so that's the you're the only person responsible for making sure this happens and you have got you know access to all the all the different resources that you need but you are like the essentially the project manager to, to bring it to life another thing that was uh another thing that was a problem was what they called dependencies now i'd heard a bit about dependencies before with when it comes to software and stuff uh but it was slowing down their growth and it was, slow, it was causing a lot of a lot of drag really and dependencies are like if well now this is explained in the book and i'll see if i can explain it from, from my own understanding of it but when amazon first started there was like one central place where all their one massive big program that ran amazon basically 
Um, they call it ACB, Amazon.com Books, right? It was the thing that they started, they started selling books. And that piece of software that they had is what they they kept uh, adding on to, kind of like, you know, keep you know making changes to it as they needed to. So any, I would imagine it's like a house of cards then. Like if, if I want to make a change because I'm, I'm, I want to make a special offer on, on selling kids bikes or something, it's like the, the butterfly effect is, is the, if I change this little piece of code and it's all in the one thing, it's going to have a knock on effect. And so they had a, a, a team in place whose job it was to okay every single change that was necessary. Um, you'd like write your proposal, put it to the, this, uh, what did they call it? ACB cabal, right? Is what they used to call them. These, these team like who were really protective of the, of the source code, if you like. Um, and they had to make sure that that nobody made a change would have some you know catastrophic effect and bring the whole website down. And it was as you can imagine, the the more they wanted to grow, the more difficult that got, and the more uh, complex it got. And you can probably imagine the the egos that were involved as well, like people stopping me doing my job because they're saying that you know it's going to affect the software and so on. Those kinds of things are um, definitely going to slow down your growth. So. All of these um, dependencies, as they call them, this this, um, this idea of that oh, my team's dependent on another team doing something, was a big problem. And the story that one of them tells in the book is um, is the affiliate program, right? Where they thought, well, they wanted to make a small change to the, to the affiliate program. And if you're not sure what that means, I'll, I'll explain it. Um, the idea is, let's say we don't have it on our website yet, but we will. Um, where let's say we talk about a book like working backwards, we'll have a link where you go through our link onto the Amazon website and buy the book and you'll be tracked through that. And we're an affiliate of Amazon then. So if Amazon uh, sell you that book or you buy that book from Amazon, we'll, we'll get a little bit of the money from that because we sent you to Amazon to buy it. Right. So we're like a third party sellers, really what they call affiliates. But what they wanted to do, the change they wanted to make was that, what they noticed is that when people were using these affiliate links, so let's say I was sending you to the Amazon website to buy the book, Working Backwards, what they found was that when people went through that link and landed on Amazon, they didn't always buy the thing that they went there to to see. They'd click around the site and buy three or four other things. And the, the way they wanted to change the affiliate program was to make sure that if me, right, as the owner of Use Because, sends you to Amazon, uh, through a link, let's say I put a link on our website saying, you know, you should buy the book working backwards. You click on it and you go, in, go through it. And actually, I don't need the book right now. I'm going to buy these other things instead. They want to make sure that that me, Amazon, wants to make sure that I still make money from uh, the other things that you buy, having gone in that session. They thought that was like a, a fair way to do it for the um, uh, for the affiliate, which would be me in this case. I hope I've explained that right. Um, but changing that code was horrendous. Like they thought it would be a, a simple enough change to the code to track somebody, not just to what they land on their, their landing page, but everything else that happens in that, that session on that website. And, uh, it became impossible, right. Um, because of the way these things were ordered. And that's what he starts talking about the, the ABC thing, the, the DB cabal is what they call them, the database cabal. Um, they, they basically gave a go, no go for you want to make that change. And this is another great thing that I suppose uh, makes Amazon Amazon is that they said uh, a lot of a lot of companies would look at that and go, okay, well we need more communication in between the teams to make sure that everyone knows exactly what's happening and um, you know great great relationships between blah, all the different teams and all that. But they actually had a different way of doing it. They said what we need is less communication, not more communication. We need less communication between the teams. Because all that communication is causing um, confusion and it's causing uh, bottlenecks and uh, log jams and all that kind of stuff. And it's very time consuming. So what they decided to do then was to uh, give autonomy to each team. So they kind of created these um, two, two pizza teams is what they call them to begin with. Now, by the end of the book, the two pizza teams, I think they said they're, they're not really a, a, a thing anymore. You don't hear about them as much. But a two pizza team basically is a team that is um, can, can be fed by two pizzas, essentially. So it's going to be about 10 people. And the idea is that a team would be autonomous. right? So they would, they would be able to, con- to do whatever they wanted to do. They'd create their own code. They'd do 
um, uh, whatever whatever they were tasked to do, they would kind of build it all themselves. And then what they did was they would have APIs, right? Um, I am going to Google API right now. Um, because I looked it up. No, I can't remember. API stands for. Come on, computer. Not telling me. Computer says no. Application programming interface. See, I knew I knew it. Application programming interface. And what that means is the way they explain it in the book is it's a great way of explaining it, really. It's like if you went into a restaurant and um, ordered ordered food, right? A sandwich, a pizza, whatever. You don't go and make it yourself, right? You, you, there's, there's a list of things that are already on the menu and you pick from one of those. You don't go into the kitchen and make it yourself. So the way it, these autonomous teams work would almost be like the same thing. These APIs or this documentation would exist. And I know I'm, I'm probably singing to the choir here to some of the people who are listening to this podcast, but for those who don't know how these things work, and I kind of had half an idea, but not 100%. The way it works is that these autonomous teams would create a documentation, which would be like the menu in a restaurant. Here's the things that you can do. You can plug into our software, into our into our team, and you can do this, 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 and this. You can't do anything else. But the same way that when you go into a, a restaurant and uh, ask for something that isn't on the menu, you'll know that the answer is either going to be it's not you're not guaranteed to get it you might get it you might not it's the same thing when you approach one of these autonomous teams we need to be able to change this particular thing on the amazon website you go well these are the things you can do this 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 and this you say well i've got a very specific request well we may accommodate you or we may not we may not be able to accommodate you and by having that those apis are um are genius because they they are uh they're pre-made they're they're ready-made kind of things for you to to kind of uh, plug into and and do whatever you need to do and if you do need to then have communication with the team then you can do it um so by doing that then they were able to have these single threaded leaders of these different things right so by having these autonomous teams and you could kind of uh, plug and play where you needed to to get things done and um so yeah it's actually have, i have a note there it says two pizza teams led to single threaded leadership so they started off with these autonomous teams and then they they were able to 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 put the single threaded leadership over those teams then and kind of pull those teams together when they needed to and um, communication then another genius thing is that and i i've seen it a lot as well where you know everything uh, everything is about uh, uh powerpoint presentations or google slide presentations and i think this is great the way you know jeff bezos is is an int- a very interesting character but He's able to just not go along with the crowd, I suppose, and 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 see things for what they are. And he said PowerPoint presentations uh, are a waste of time because they it's too easy to gloss over uh, or flatten ideas. Or somebody who's good at presenting can convince you of anything. Now, if you imagine that if I'm if I'm a great presenter and I've got a, a half baked idea, I can sell it to you. But if I'm a terrible presenter and I've got a really great idea, I might not be able to sell it to you. So. He said there was too much reliance on, um, on the, the skills of the presenter. And essentially what they did then is they got rid of PowerPoint presentations. They were banned. And they eventually settled on a six-pager. So they, they weren't sure about how, how long it should be. Um, but if you're, if you're presenting, say, the, the old style of presenting to, to, uh, to, to leadership or to management on something, you didn't present. You rolled up a six-pager. And if the meeting was an hour long, the first 20 minutes were given over to everybody sitting in silence reading your six pages of documentation, or not even documentation, just laying out what the problem is, why it's a problem, um, and what your what your proposed solution is. And he said, the, the two guys writing the book said, the first time you experience this in a meeting, it's weird, like people go in, they sit into the conference room, and everyone says hello, and whatever. And then these six pages are handed around to everyone. And uh, everyone sits in silence for 20 minutes reading the pages. And then you as the presenter or the, the person who's proposed the idea, you get peppered with questions. So as part of your six pager, you'll have an FAQ, a frequently asked questions section, um, where you try and you know, knock most of those out of the park before they, before they come at you. But they, that's how, that's how uh, 
that's how things should be done. Like if, if I had done like six or 10 slides on, on this fantastic idea that I had, like there's not enough information there. So give people all the information. And what they said it did was that it, it forced the people who are making these, these proposals to really think it through about the resources that they'll need, um, the timelines for getting done, um, why it's great for the customer, all those kinds of things. It was a fantastic way of doing it. But obviously they said at the very beginning, people were um, dead set against it. They were either trying to um, squeeze, they were like, they were making a tiny font and they were squeezing the margins out right to the edge of the page and filling it with information. Or they were making it 40 pages long because they were afraid of their life to, to leave anything out. People just ignoring the limits and they had to really, you know, uh, stamp down on, on people and say it's six pages. This is the font. This is the, the font size. It has to be, you know, double spaced or whatever. And uh, people eventually got on board with then, and, it, and it, it definitely forces you to think in a different way about how how um, how to run a meeting. Like if you really want to get your point across, then you have to do the work leading up to that meeting. You can't just kind of bang a few slides together and, and hope it all works out. And they said as well that that uh, in those meetings where they were, people were doing PowerPoint presentations, and we've all seen this where it's obvious that that's the first time the person doing the presenting, that's the first time they've seen that slide and they're trying to just bullshit their way through it. Whereas if it's a six page document that you had to write up, then you've had to talk, talk to other people, um, you know, in those other autonomous teams about how you'll, how you'll pull in their resources and, and how it'll all work and the timelines and how you'll actually project manage this into life. And they also said that, uh, that Jeff was almost always the last person to finish reading those six pages, which was uh, interesting. But the, I can't imagine I've been in a meeting where you just read for the first 20 minutes. I think, it's a, I think that's really, really clever. I really like that idea because I have worked in companies where um, PowerPoint presentations were, um, were the go-to thing and people spend an inordinate amount of time putting these slides together and I'm still going to have to talk about it. I'm still going to have to remember lots of stuff. But if you just let me write it all down and hand it to you, it's a lot better. Um, and then chapter five then is, is called Working Backwards. And it reminded me of the uh, the seven habits of highly effective people. Um, I can't remember which exact uh, habit it is. But to, to, to begin with the end in mind is to make sure that you have um, you've thought about what I'm actually trying to achieve here. And one of the things they did it, one of the ways they did it for... Um, for any new products that they launched, um, either hardware or software products, was to 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 start with the press release and the frequently asked questions. So the frequently asked, so both internal and external. So that say say external stuff, the the frequently asked questions might be stuff that the the customer will ask. They try and preempt them, and they don't just guess. If they come up with a question, they go, all right, well, actually, I'm not sure if that's even possible, or if somebody even wants that, or if there's a big enough market for that. And then that would lead to their investigation. But the same with the press release then as well. They talk about, you know, what, why would anyone care, right? Who cares if this is, if you're going to invent the Kindle? Um, so they would, the, the PR FAQ is what the, is, is how they would begin a new project, whether it was Amazon Prime or um, Prime Video, um, uh, Amazon Web Services, AWS, Kindle, um, all the different uh, devices that they have, um, next day shipping, all that kind of stuff. It all starts with the, the press release. It's, I don't know how they pronounce it, but it's called, it's, in the book it's PR slash FAQ. I don't know if they just call it PR FAQ. Um, but that, that would go through iterations first before they would build anything, before they put anything together. So another very clever way of, of putting things together, I think, Um and a, a note I have written here is that a question that must be answered in the PR and the press releases, so what, right? Which is, you know, the product must be meaningful, meaningfully better. It should be faster, cheaper, or easier. There has to be some reason why we're going to do this and um, some reason why it exists. Um, they came up with this story then um, called the Melinda, uh, and they kind of went through the PR FAQ for it. Uh, so the Belinda was uh, a box for groceries and e-commerce purchases that stays outside somebody's house. So if you imagine like a, a box outside your house that you can take your food deliveries in if you're not at home. So it keeps things, keeps cold things cold. And there's also space in there for, um, you know, shoes you've ordered from Amazon or whatever. And they went through the FAQ, like what will it cost to build it? What the, the bill of materials? Um, how will you convince non employees to use it correctly so there's a third party 
uh, delivery company using it? How would you convince them to use it properly? Uh, how would you stop people stealing stuff? Uh, all these things that kind of went through. It's re- a really interesting case study for how how I've got this great idea for for this thing that should go outside people's houses and they'll pay us lots of money to use it. If you think through all the different things, and, and that leads then to say, you know, how do you stop people stealing stuff? Well, they well, the answer to that was they'd, they'd put like a, a camera on it that would be, um, uh, you know, connected to your phone or whatever, like, and you'd be able to see footage of people um, taking things that also have um, uh, uh, weighing scales on, on the floor, the, this boxing so they know if something's removed and all that kind of thing. So so by by asking those questions in the first place, they're able to work backwards and go, what what should this actually look like? What what are the things that should be included in this in this uh, in this box, right? Uh, number six then metrics. So to tell the story about uh, Jeff and Colin Colin Breyer, um, who was his uh, technical advisor, if I remember right. Uh, they're in a meeting with a CEO of some other company, and as they're in the meeting, um, the CEO the CEO's assistant comes in with a sheet of paper with um, the share price of their company, not Amazon, the other company. And the CEO's delighted, going, oh, fantastic, the share price has gone up 30 cents since yesterday. And afterwards then, Jeff and Colin were in on their way to the next meeting, and Jeff made the point, going, you know, oh, this is a nonsense metric. Like, who cares? He had no in- impact on that 30 cent. He shouldn't be happy about that share price going up 30 30 cent because he he didn't do it that's an and and jeff came up with this idea of of that being an output metric that's something that you cannot control all you can do is control the input metrics that cause that 30 cent rise in the share price and he said that all a lot of people are just focused on these kind of what you might call a vanity metric of 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 uh you know a vanity metric of like things that you're not really impacting, right? So he's not really impacting this this the share price. He's impacting all the other things that lead to the share price, but your 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 focus has to be on the things that you can control. And so they come up with this idea of a flywheel, and you can Google this. If you just Google Amazon flywheel, it's um it's very fairly straightforward. But I'll, I'll explain it as I've as I've written out here and as a, as a note for myself. It starts off with them um, lower cost structure, which leads to lower prices, which leads to a better customer experience, which leads to more traffic, which leads to more people selling things on Amazon, which leads to better selection, and that leads to better customer experience. Um, and growth is in the middle there. And the idea there is that the the growth is not something you can impact because that's an output metric, but you can impact all the other things. You can you can push a lower cost structure. You can push lower prices. You can you can push a better uh, customer experience, all that kind of thing, um, and it gives this idea of 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 one of the metrics that they would measure was um, stock, right? Which you think would be fairly straightforward. Um, you know, is something in stock or is it not, or how much stock do we have on hand in our fulfillment centers? And he said, what they do is that the different ways of doing it, essentially. But one of the ways they do it is that eleven p.m. every night they take a catalog snapshot. And the question is basically, what do we have in stock? But they have to they have to weigh uh, the out of stock by the number of sold in the last month. So, say for example, product A sold thirty in the last month, and product B sold ten. Then product A is three times the impact on their stock levels than product B, right? And once you start thinking down that road, going, oh God, that gets very complicated very quickly. But that's how they had to do it. They're the kind of metrics that they had to kind of put their focus on, I suppose, is to see, well, we say we have it in stock, but who cares if we've got 100 of them, we've got 10 of the other things, and the, the 10 are going to be gone by tomorrow, and they're going to be out of stock um, much quicker than the, the other things, right? So they, they, they have to make sure that they're, they're counting the stock, not just, you know, how many things are physically in their warehouses, but how many should we have of that particular thing? So there's a lot of a lot of mathematics going on there as well. Um, one of the things then they would do as well is um, an, an, an analysis, I struggle with that, uh, 
one of the questions that might come up is like, and in every aspect of the business, the, the, the leaders of the teams are, are expected to ask these questions and to find the answers. But the example he gives is why can we pick 100 items in a day shift, but only 30 in a night shift? And they go for the correction of errors with the five whys. And I definitely have talked about the five whys before, but the five whys are, um, you just keep asking why until uh, until you get to an answer, right? Why can we only pick 30 things in the night shift? Well, because people are tired at night. Why? Uh, well, because you know, I don't know what the answer to that be, but you know, they keep asking why until until you get to the to the bottom line as to as to why this particular thing is happening. So that five why is that idea of five why is I think it comes from Six Sigma. Um and uh it's a great way to do you know it's a great it's a great way to run your life sometimes as well. Like you know I I, I seem to only exercise twice a week and really I want to be doing it four times a week. Um why do you only do it twice a week? Because of it, X, Y, and Z. Why is that then? Well, because of this, why? Because of that, why? Because of that. And eventually you get to, oh, that's why I'm doing it. Yeah. You kind of once you run out of answers, there's probably something in the last answer that you gave, generally. So the second part of the book then I won't get into in too much detail really at all, because we're at 45 minutes here. Um but the the second part of the book is is the invention machine at work, and um, he talks about Kindle and Prime and AWS and how they went about doing it. Right, there's a great quote though from from Jeff Jeff like I know him, Jeff Bezos at the at the start of um, the second part of the book where he says failure and invention are inseparable twins, and if you think about Thomas Edison inviting inviting inventing the light bulb, uh, that becomes you know, he went through 10,000 um, errors or failures before he got to the light bulb. You fail your way to success in all things, um, generally. Uh, and they tell a the story then about the fire phone that nobody wanted. It was too expensive. The features were not that interesting. Um, Apple at the time were killing it with the iPhone. So, uh, And then they tell a the story about the Kindle and, you know, th- there was a lot of talk at the time in internally in in Amazon about well do we want to build it ourselves probably not we're not we're not a hardware company we're software and do we want to build it ourselves or do we want to bring in third party uh, companies to to help build this product for us and Jeff was adamant that they wanted to build it themselves because um, they'll have all that learning then they'll fail their way towards it and he said you either want to be a fast follower or you want to invent and um one of their principles is 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 for Amazon to be somewhere that people invent things, and I think that's where a lot of fulfillment comes from in their in their staff as well. Is that they they're they're given permission to to invent things and to to fail their way towards success. I suppose he talks then about um about Prime um and how it came about for uh, so Prime started as you know um two day delivery, then one day delivery, and now I think right down to next day delivery, um. Random thing I just thought of uh, a few years ago. I remember seeing all these patents or patents that um, Amazon had, and one of them was for like to fly blimps. I don't forgot that. I think it was a blimp. They wanted to like float blimps over cities, essentially, and those cities or those blimps would be their fulfillment centers, and they would have drones going up to collect things from these uh, blimps and then dropping them down like to to your you know, back garden or, or front yard for my American friends. Uh, like, that is crazy. Like, the, the mad shit that they came up with. Um, I often wondered, like, would you just see... <laughs> oh, the Amazon blimp is overhead. We'll be able to get next day delivery. Um, yeah, it's mad. Like, I, I'd love to see it. Like, I'd, I'd, I'd order a pair of shoes just to see the, the drone going up to collect them in the blimp and then dropping them back down. I don't know how... I don't know if they just kind of had all these wacky ideas and... Um, you know, just kind of patented them to to protect the idea or what, but um, I don't know. Drone delivery, it's interesting. But anyway, with the the prime thing, they said they said the customers had three main concerns: price, selection, and convenience. And uh, they were doing lots of stuff on price and selection, but not convenience, and that's what led to to Amazon Prime then. And then eventually when Prime Video came out, they had lots of different ideas about how they would compete with Netflix and um, Hulu at the time in America. And eventually they decided to add it in as a benefit, um, as a, a, oh, by the way, kind of thing with, with uh, signing up to, to Prime for the year for Prime delivery. You also get this, um, this streaming service as well. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna finish it with this. I was always confused by that. I always thought I thought Prime was the thing where you get stuff delivered, you know, um, really quickly. And then it's also the video stuff. I remember it was only when I read the book in the last few days I was thinking, oh, that's what this, all right, that's why. I never really paid enough attention to see a Prime Video. Is that the same thing as something to do with you know getting next day delivery or whatever? I don't know. I didn't pay that much attention. I I think that's something that was a little bit confusing and wasn't that well uh, wasn't that well explained, but. Anyway, we're at 50 minutes. Uh, the book, again, is Working Backwards. Bring it up to the camera there. By uh, Colin Breyer and Bill Carr. Uh, I think I, I think it, there's no point in me saying it's a great read because, you know, I say it every single time. But I only, I only, I only do podcasts and books that I think are great reads. So it's, it's definitely well worth a read. It's, it's, there's, some, there's lots of food for thought in there for... for um, for strategy really in your, in your business little little bits and pieces you can take out and kind of rethink things about uh you know the worst thing for business is always you know that's how we do that's it, that, that's how we've always done it right if that's if that's your approach and you're fucked so you need to make sure you're, you're thinking through all those things the next podcast will most likely be this book that i've started reading it's uh happy by darren brown <laughs> oh sorry and uh Yeah, so we'll talk to you soon. Thanks very much and uh, goodbye for now.